You're listening to the Whole Hawk Football Podcast, sponsored by Bud Anderson Home Services, bringing you the latest news, position analysis, and more. Here's your hosts, Matt Jones and Scotty Bordelon. You get into mid-December, you expect things to be slowing down a little bit, but it hasn't been that way for Razorback football just the last week. Traylon Burks has announced that he's going to go pro, isn't going to play in the bowl game. Jalen Catalan and Ricky Stromberg have announced that they are coming back to Arkansas for the 2022 season. Uh, Sam Pittman wants a new contract. We're going to get into all that today and, and talk about all those items with Clay Henry of Hogs Illustrated and Scotty Bordelon of Whole Hog Sports. I'm Matt Jones. Let's start with Traylon Burks, Clay, and, and the impact of him not playing in the bowl game against Penn State really isn't that surprising, I don't think, because, you know, any anymore, you just you expect the players who are going to be high round draft picks uh, not to play in a bowl game. The, the ones who play for the teams that are in the, you know, the championship conversation, they play. But the ones uh, who are outside of that, it's very rare that they play really began with Christian McCaffrey about five or six years ago. Uh, and has, has just really continued. And uh, he's not going to play for Arkansas against Penn State. What do you think that this does for the Razorbacks in that Penn State game? Because he's been such a big part of their offense all year. Yeah, I was trying to just imagine what, what it would be like. And I, I went back to the um, the Auburn game last year uh, at Auburn. I don't know if you all remember that was uh, – I think it was the Hurricane game where everybody thought it was going to be horrible weather and it kind of rained a little bit, but it all moved on through and Burks came out, uh, had a sore knee. I believe that's what it was. And he tried to run a few routes and then just, they shut him down and they had offense for that game and they were able to throw the ball. Frank's, uh, tossed it around pretty good. And I think that was, uh, that was the game when I realized, okay, what Kendall Br- Browse can do. And, you know, he's, I mean, Burks was quote, their best player at that particular time. And you take him out of the offense and they rolled pretty good. In fact, it was, uh, really the defense in the fourth quarter that let that game get away, but they, they came from way back and moved the ball and, uh, you know, I think Devion Warren and Tyson Morris, but they might have had decent games. I'm trying to put it all back in my mind, but I uh, think that they will they will figure it out. And you've got some time here uh, to check out the pieces that you have. And I think they got some pieces. I think they've got, you know, multiple backs that they can kind of spread around in some different roles that maybe, you know, you don't do everything that Burks did with one guy, but, you know, Rocket Sanders and AJ Green. And I I just think that they, they have weapons and that's what makes this offense roll is that they, you know, if you go back to the, the Texas game and the Texas A&M game and, you know, Burks wasn't really performing in a great way quite yet. You know, he was still, trying to figure out the things, you know, was wearing a boot all week, you know, had not practiced in preseason. So in my mind, they can overcome it, but he's still, that's the best player on the team. I mean, he's, he's the guy, I mean, he's a first rounder and you just don't take him out and not have some consequences. I think this is, it could be one of those situations where, you know, with trailing out of the picture, you just you try to get your best guys on the field. And I know that sounds really simple, but sometimes when a when a guy goes down or is out, it's kind of just like the next man up. But I see it as like a potential situation where you can get maybe a, a Rocket Sanders on the field and that allows maybe a guy like Dominic Johnson to play a little bit more in the backfield. And we, you know, we Rocket was a really good receiver in high school. Like, I feel like we kind of forget that a little bit. Like, he was a receiver, and then when he got to Arkansas, they made a decision to move him to tailback, and that really obviously worked out for him well. But I think Rocket could probably see some time on the perimeter. Um, I think, you're like Clay mentioned, you're just going to have to do it by committee. And Davion Warren, you know, in that game that Clay mentioned at Auburn last year, he had a really good game. I think that was kind of the start of his, you know, him kind of breaking out last season. 
um, I think they're just going to need him to step up and, you know, put him in some maybe advantageous situations where he's got, you know, where they can pick on a mismatch with him a little bit. And you're going to need Warren Thompson and Tyson Morris to be really sure handed. And I think it's pretty important that Warren Thompson kind of gets back to maybe early in the season where he was catching passes and running after the catch instead of catching the ball and immediately falling on his backside. Like he kind of turned himself a little bit into a possession type receiver when he's one of the more athletic guys that they've got, you know, at at the receiver spot. Uh, I think Bryce Stevens is another interesting candidate. I think he's moved up in that, in that slot spot. I think as of, you know, maybe about three or four weeks left in the season, he was their number two slot and Keytron Jackson is a, is another interesting name too. There's, there's lots of talent with those young guys. I think they're probably going to have to lean on, um, you know, Davion Warren, Warren Thompson, Tyson Morris, those guys, they've been, Davion hasn't been always sure handed this season, but I think you can, you know, get him involved in some quick screen type stuff, maybe some end arounds, that kind of thing, get the ball in his hands and, you know, utilize his speed a little bit more than, than you have previously. I think you saw that with Warren right in, in one little stretch of the Missouri game where they went boom, boom, boom. And, you know, he figured in, in all those games, I, I think they got they got Missouri caught with the matchup where the guy running with him and it's like all right we're just we're not going to sub we're just going to keep running plays and uh, make them call a timeout or you know just just so that's what Kendall does is that he sees a matchup he sees a player against a you know a defensive guy that he can exploit and that a lot of times you know you're wondering well why are they going to hurry up well he likes that matchup and he doesn't want to give the defense a chance to to change it i just i think that that he is really good with his with with athletic guys in space and like he he's going to find a matchup for rocket he's going to find a matchup for aj and he's he's going to you know figure out a way to move the ball uh, but then the other part, who's your best player now? Well, it's KJ. And I think that, you know, you don't have a game the next week. And what he did with KJ, I'm talking about Browse against Ole Miss, where they had a really good linebacker. Okay, we're going we're gonna to put you in space against our quarterback. Chad Campbell was the guy. And Campbell's a really good player, but he couldn't handle KJ. And that, that we'll see what happens, but I, I think that, you know, if, if Penn state's middle linebacker is not ultra fast, you're going to, you're going to see some interesting play calls for, to see what KJ can match up with him. So that that's, that's a look, but uh, yeah, it's the, the Traylon Burks uh, void is going to be filled by a lot of different things. It's not just one that you can put your finger on, you know, di- different situations, different matchups. And that's, that's what, that's what Kendall Browse does. KJ quarterback run game going and you got Dominic Johnson in the backfield as your lead blocker. That's a, that's not a half bad planner right there either. I'm sure one of those old miss linebackers remembers that. I mentioned Christian McCaffrey and uh, he kind of started this trend. It goes back even further than that. Uh, uh, you know, I even remember at Arkansas, Darren McFadden uh, before the Cotton Bowl. Didn't he take out a big insurance policy, Clay, uh, before he played in the Cotton Bowl game against Missouri after after Houston Nutt was fired? I think he did. Uh, a few years before that, Sean Andrews didn't play in the Independence Bowl. I think that they said that there was some sort of uh, uh, allergy or nasal sinus problem uh, with him. There's there's a lot of people who think that you know it was it was just that he was protecting himself. Uh, and his, his draft status a few months later, uh, this is something that it, I think it's hard for anybody who is not in their shoes to uh, understand what they're wrestling with. Because uh, think about the Jalen Smith injury in the Fiesta Bowl a few years ago. He did OK. He ended up getting his big contract from the Cowboys, uh, but it really took Dallas uh, taking a, a chance on him. I think that, you know, it was, there, there was a, a, a big influence that his brother was already a running back in the Cowboys organization. They took a chance on him as a, a second rounder uh, after he suffered that injury. They stuck with him uh, through his rehab. He didn't get to play that first year. He ended up getting his big contract in Dallas. But for every Jalen Smith, there are probably 
you know, a lot of players who would not get that opportunity. And I, I just think it's really hard for anybody who's not in their shoes, Clay, to, to grasp uh, what they're what they're going through right now. Yeah, so here's what I was told with with Traylon's situation, and and you know he he was counseled thoroughly by Sam Pittman and by Bo Hembry, who's the you know longtime Warren coach. That that uh, in fact Traylon jokes that that's what he wants to do sometime. He wants Bo Hembry's job, and and uh, is going to go back to Warren and coach when he's when he's done. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's that is what he does. You know, those those guys like Jerry's right. And Traylon, I mean, that they love hanging around that locker room and that field house it, it Warren. But uh, so what I was told is they, they all reviewed what the insurance policy they could get for Traylon. And it wasn't going to cover really what a first round pick was going to get. It was, it was going to be substandard. They, they could not find, a policy that would really protect him. And so it's like, he doesn't really have a choice in that matter. If the policy, in other words, it was going to be way more money to buy that policy to cover close. And it wasn't even going to come close. So at that point, you just have to, you got, you got to do what he did and and that's move on to the next, next game. And that that's the, the NFL combine. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's sad that that's where some of these guys are and want to play, but it just doesn't make any financial sense. I think that's absolutely right. Like at a certain point, you know, I think we knew going into the Missouri game that we were possibly probably watching Traylon for the last time. And, you know, Traylon's the kind of kid, and a lot of people understand this, like he probably did want to play in the bowl game. But the financial sense, what just it wasn't really there. And at a certain point, if you realize what your future looks like and you can have your future realized in just a matter of months, like you've got to protect your investment, like and you've got to be really, really smart about uh, what you do. And if you guys haven't read what Clay wrote um, in his his column on on trailing, I thought it was super interesting that he was like really, really considering playing in the bowl game. And then the injury to John Mechie happened in the SEC championship game. I think that was that, that kind of thing for a star receiver like Traylon is in similar shoes or Mechie is going to be in similar shoes to, to, you know, where Traylon is now, like he's good. You know, Mechie's a big time player. Traylon's a big time player and those injuries, man, they can just happen you know, when you're at the top of your route and you're, you're, you know, you're about to, your button, you're running a button hook and the ball's about to be on the way. And then your knee just get, I mean, it can be over in an instant. Um, it's just, to me, it's just, I found it really interesting that, you know, we're not probably, we're not getting to see trailer possibly because of an injury to a player on another team. Like that just, that's, it's kind of unfortunate for Arkansas fans, but it's just kind of the, way things are now like you've just got to be super super heady um you know just kind of protect your own investment we are recording this in the middle of uh what's national signing day what's basically become national signing day the uh, the wednesday in december i know it's a three-day period and there's still the late signing period in, in february but for all intents and purposes, this is National Signing Day. We're not going to talk a lot about signees today. Uh, Dudley Dawson and I will have a podcast that kind of goes over the signing class more in depth next week. But I bring that up to say that the day before signing day, they got the equivalent of a five-star recruit in Jalen Catalan, who announced that he's going to come back in 2022. NFL draft eligible. There's been a lot of you know intrigue in him. Obviously, he's a great player, but I don't think his size really matches up with what NFL – uh, teams are looking for uh, at the safety position. Uh, he, he's an interesting prospect, Clay, because he is so good. He makes so many plays, but you know it's, it's kind of like Kyler Murray. Uh, you know, he he just doesn't fit the prototype for that position in the NFL. And you know, going back to you know what we were talking about earlier, for every you know one example, there's dozens of other examples where it doesn't work out. You know, I think teams are probably a little bit leery of taking Jalen Catalan uh, in the NFL draft, at least very high. Uh, so he's going to come back to Arkansas and see what he can do. And, uh, you know, hopefully for him, he can stay healthy because staying healthy has really been the the bugaboo for him. Didn't get to play his senior year of high school. Only got to play in four games in 2019 and 
of course, had that season ending uh, shoulder surgery in October of this year, 2020, really the only year that he's been able to stay healthy. Yeah, what we've seen, Matt, is uh, is that he delivers incredible hits and his body doesn't hold up. And that that's uh, that's his, uh, you know, we, we love to see it and we know that it's coming, but you just kind of wince. is like, get up, dude. <laughs> He's like, you know, where are you? Okay. Uh, he, you know, he hurt his shoulder. Uh, in fact, I was at a scrimmage last spring and he delivered a hit that, uh, was just incredible. And he's to the sideline and he's got his pads off and they're checking him and you can see his head drop and, you know, he didn't come back the rest of that scrimmage. And I don't think he scrimmaged the, the next week, you know, we're into fall camp, same thing happens. Uh, you know, it, that shoulder, I don't guess was really ever well, it deteriorated as you know, he played. And I think if you go back and you really watch tape of, of Jalen in the six games that he played, you know, he had a, bad shoulder, bad collarbone, broken hand, uh, cast on his hand, that he was not effective. He wasn't the same player that he'd been last year, and he tried to play, and he's he knows that he's he's playing for an NFL contract. He knows that he's, you know, the anchor or the back end of, you know, the, his team's defense, he's the captain, uh, but he just didn't have it, and it was, it was sad, and I think the the – the thing that stuck out is is there's a deep ball uh, on on a corner route. Um, I guess it's a post corner, and he's on top of the route. He's there to make the interception. Goes up with his hands. He's got that cast on. And he doesn't make the interception. He would have made that interception every single time last year. He's got incredible ball skills, and you just see him playing. He's a shell of himself, and but he's he's got to prove that he can hold up in a you know a twelve game season to get that you know second round money or even possibly first round money. But boy, I love to watch him play, and he's uh, you know I, I think the first time I saw him in a practice, I said, well, that's the honey badger, you know the Tyrone Matthew that played at LSU and is, is playing with the. Chiefs now because he understands everything that's happening. He is a coach on the field. He, you know, he's an encourager for his teammates. He's an intense tackler. You go back to the Tennessee game last year when Tennessee was dominating up front in the offensive line. And he made 11 tackles in the first quarter. And Tennessee had just mashed Arkansas up front, but he's making tackles two yards, three yards, two yards. They weren't really getting any any effectiveness out of the way they were mashing the Arkansas defensive front because he just took over the game with his play in the back end. And I, you know, I thought then, hey, he's a first rounder, but his body just hasn't held up. And it it's uh uh you know it's it's sad for him, but it's also a great bonus for Sam Pittman. And I, you know, I think that he's the one that told Jalen, hey, you're you know, they're saying fifth round, sixth round, or not drafted at all. And I, I don't think he believed it, but I think he's now gotten the feedback to understand that, hey, you, you, you've got to go prove yourself in a different way, and that's that you can stay healthy over a season. There are those players who are just great college players. I mean, Grant Morgan is a great college football player. Bumper pull, you know, they're, they're not going to be high NFL, you know, draft prospects. It reminds me of college baseball you know a lot of times you think about Dave Van Horn's teams and all of the really good college baseball players he's had who never had a chance of, of being you know professional baseball players players like uh, you know Bo Bigham and Tim Carver who were middle infielders for four seasons on a couple of college world series teams Tyler Spoon you know was a really good college baseball player uh, never was going to have the, the the potential really to go pro I know he went pro for a short time but you know was never going to make the major leagues uh, you know Scotty there's just really good college players and they make your teams better and you know, I feel like these guys like Jalen Catalan coming back bumper pull has yet to decide but he's got that potential to come back uh, there, there are some others who could potentially come back as well you know these are the types of moves that, that could really make Arkansas good next year in addition to the players that they're planning to sign this week yeah Jalen's just a great leader too and I think that's that's a, a really big deal to, to get him back and I think it was 
really wise of him to decide to come back. You know, he may not have really had much of another option just because I just I think Clay nailed it. He, he didn't put just a bunch of great tape together this year. And a lot of that is just his, you know, his his health. It just wasn't right uh, really from kind of head to toe um, beginning, in, you know, in fall camp and even going back to last year, I guess. Um, but there were just certain there were several moments that I can remember pretty vividly where, you know, the Jalen Catalan of 2020 would have made the play that he didn't make this, you know, in, in the games that he did play this year. And one of the plays that stands out was an early fourth and one or fourth and two at Georgia. And Georgia turns around and hands the ball off. And Jalen is right there off the right edge, misses the tackle completely. And I feel like that's, you know, he's a little bit uh, leery of that, that shoulder, the, the collarbone, probably the hand a little bit too. Uh, you need all of that to to be forceful enough to bring down a, a pretty powerful Georgia running back. Um, I think it's a big deal that that Jalen's coming back, and you just you hope for his sake that he can get healthy and put some more tape together. And I I do think that he's a pro. I think he's too. I think he's his ball skills, like Clay said, are, are too great. Um, great great leader, obviously a great locker room guy too, and he's just um, he's just got. I think he's got all the intangibles that that you know, teams at the next level are looking for in a safety. And I think they'll give him a shot um, despite his size, just because of, of everything that he brings to the table. And of course, I mentioned earlier, Ricky Stromberg also going to come back. Dalton Wagner's, Wagner has announced that he's going to come back uh, for another season, put off WWE for a year at least. Uh, you saw the, the NIL announcement with him that uh, he's one of the uh, athletes who's been accepted into a, a WWE program that could potentially lead to a, a professional wrestling pathway which is funny because there was so much talk about him being a professional wrestler last year and i don't think anybody really ever believed it and then nil comes along and wwe they they put together this nil package and there he is as one of you know 15 you know potential uh wrestlers in their company i, I just thought that there was a, a good bit of irony in that uh but arkansas you know there were semifinalists this year for the joe moore award which is the best uh, offensive line group in college football and now next year clay they could potentially have four of their starters back, Wagner, Stromberg, Bo Limmer, and Brady Latham, you know, assuming that nobody transfers or is unhappy with their playing time or something. And a lot of competition probably in that group next year. you got to believe that Jalen St. John, Tykeus Crawford, Luke Jones, uh, they're all going to factor into, you know, a, a starting battle during the spring and the preseason. Uh, you know, Pittman – you know, he always talks about having depth on the offensive line, and, and that's what makes a good football team. And you're finally got, you're, you're starting to get to that point where they could have as many as seven offensive linemen next year before you even count in guys who have redshirted or are coming in maybe as a transfer or as a, a freshman next year that they feel probably pretty good about playing. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, it, it takes time for the majority of your offensive line prospects to mature. And boy, it was, I, I vividly remember the press conference on Monday after the open date week where Sam just lit up when he was talking about Devin Manuel. And that's a guy that's 6'7", 360, uh, maybe taller than that, and was considered, okay, does he have the feet for that body? Is he, a, you know – was he a little bit of a project? He's from Sunset, Louisiana. And there were some people that are like, I don't know. Well, now they know. Sam's Sam's put a check mark. This guy's a player. Uh, he's got to learn the offense. But when you talk about big man, he's starting to get them. You know, I, I remember asking uh, Frank Ragnow, well, what, what is it that makes Sam an offensive line special? And he goes, he gets freaks. And – slowly but surely starting to build those guys and you know some of them you know they need a little development they need a little you know some poundage some of them have to take you know Jalen St. John he had to take some off um, but then you look on the signing day class that they're getting today Marion Harris just a monster of a human being you know he's six seven three sixty uh, that's Sam Pittman size and you know, then you've got 
guys that have the athletic ability that maybe need just a few more like Terry Wells from Wynn that's been in the program a year. I, I think that we're going to see development in the offensive line that takes them to a level that's beyond what they were this year. I think they, they did it this year with the experience and veteran guys that have just played in so many games. And that's, that's a critical aspect of offensive line play, the way you mesh. Uh, but I think as, as they go forward, you're going to see, all right, these, this is a step up as far as size, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds heavier than this, this year's offensive line. And then, then you're going to see, uh, see things that, the passing game opens up because of the way they run the ball when they want to run it. And, uh, I, I believe that, uh, they, they have not even scratched the surface of what they can be as an offensive line group. And that's not to take anything away from what these guys did this year. They were fun to watch. Sam Pittman says it's a big person league in the sec that you have to have big people uh, to win in the SEC on both the offensive and the defensive lines. And you look back at, at Arkansas, you know, over the last decade, when they were the best was whenever Sam Pittman was their line coach and you know, developing the types like Denver Kirkland and Dan Skipper and Frank Ragnow and Sebastian Tritola, and you kind of go on down the list. I think they're getting back close to that point. The Whole Hog Football Podcast is brought to you by Bud Anderson Home Services. Visit them online at gocallbud.com. Bud Anderson is proud to be the official heating and cooling provider for the Arkansas Razorbacks. This partnership will support all Razorback athletics for over 400 student athletes across 19 sports. Woo pig! Wholehogsports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at wholehogsports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. Wholehogsports.com. Dot com. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. Welcome back to the Whole Hawk Football Podcast. Earlier this week, I called Tom Murphy from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and asked him if he'd gotten any thank you notes from the radio stations and the message boards because he has given them limitless uh, material to talk about this week with that story that he had earlier uh, about Sam Pittman's contract and the, the contract offer that Jimmy Sexton has delivered to the university uh, reportedly seven years for in the vicinity of $50 million, which would you know make it about a $7 million a year contract. Now, this is before negotiations and, and we'll see where it, it comes out. But uh, there's no doubt in my mind, Clay, that the market for a, an SEC head coach has changed a lot, even in the two years since Sam Pittman was hired. You know, we thought it was a low figure when he was hired $3 million a year. But I think that he was hired at that rate because he was an unproven head coach and it kind of mitigated what Arkansas could potentially owe him in a buyout if for some reason that it didn't work out. He's proven himself now. And when you look at the contracts that the other coaches are getting across the SEC, uh, Billy Napier hired at Florida at more than $7 million a year. Of course, Brian Kelly gets the big contract at LSU. Uh, you know, Lane Kiffin just re-upped at Ole Miss for over $7 million. Brent Venables at Oklahoma going to be coming into the league. Steve Sarkeesian, both of those hired at, you know, really large contracts. Sam Pittman, you know, now that $3 million looks really low in comparison when he's giving Arkansas results that are better than probably half the coaches in the league. Yeah, that's right. And I always uh, consider, all right, what's, what's the replacement cost? And, you know, it's like anybody that's uh, replaced, uh, you know, an, uh, an HVAC system. What, what's, what's the replacement cost for an HVAC system? I mean, it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe when you built the house, it was uh, two grand, but now it's about, 
10 grand. <laughs> Things go up. And we just saw the, the price of doing business in the SEC West. It, you know, it's, it's doubled. I mean, I, I don't know whether we blame COVID on that. I may, maybe it's just that it's, you know, incredible amount of money that's coming into the league and it could continue. It's going to be another windfall when Oklahoma and Texas come, come in the league. And I think maybe athletic directors know they're going to have that money. So, uh, they're willing to spend it. It's, you know, if you don't have it, you can't spend it, but it's the replacement cost for Sam Pittman is not 3.5 or 3.7. That's not what it is. And you've got a guy that you know can win in the SEC West. He's beat Jimbo Fisher. He's beat Mike Leach twice. He's, uh, you know, he's one and one against Lane Kiffin. He's one and one against Eli Drinkwitz. Uh, you know, he's, he's got seven SEC victories in two seasons and he's done it with the talent level or a roster that we all thought was suspect. Maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe there's more players there than we thought, but he he's retooled and it looks like he's recruiting at a good level. He's proven that he can hire coaches. He's proven that he will make changes that, that he knows that, uh, the program maybe is more important than say, you know, he, he's willing to, uh, change guys that, that he considers friends. You know, it's like, I not want to wait around, change five coaches last year after year one, because he didn't think they recruited well enough. That tells me that you've got the right fit and you've got somebody that understands leadership and how to run a program. And those are all question marks. Well, so he fits with Arkansas. Well, can you go find another guy for that price? You can't, it's going to cost you six or 7 million to replace him with that kind of a coach. So is it uncomfortable for a lot of fans, a lot of Razorback Foundation members that, that are paying the freight? Yeah, it is. It, you know, they don't want another buyout. I mean, they're still paying the Chad Morris buyout. And, you know, they've paid buyouts with Brett Bielema that, that were uncomfortable. And they, they saw money spent poorly. And they, they don't, you know, they don't want to make another mistake, but I, I think you just have to realize what you've got is solid and it's going to continue to pay dividends and yeah, you're paying up front in some ways, but you see what he can do down the road. And we've just talked about it and what they've got, what they're building and how he's able to not only recruit the players that he needs to come into the program, but he's able to recruit the guys that are already in the program, which is just as important. Uh, they lost Mike Woods to the portal, but the, the basic premise is the players want to play for him. And that's, that's what you're looking for. And I think that's, that's why you have to pay. Him. The contract request that, you know, Pittman's camp has, has put out there, you know, if Arkansas, goes for that you know i think it's a it's a deal that it, it's done in good faith i think just based on what sam has done you know almost through two full seasons you know he's you know he i mean we can we've talked about this on and on and on but just what he did last season just kind of restoring the belief in the in the pride and in the in the program and in the kids just getting them to to believe that they can compete and that they can go win because the, those kids were those kids were beaten down did probably before Sam got here, you know, we're wondering when their next win was going to come. Uh, he's already, he's turned that around pretty quick and he's doing it with kids that largely he didn't recruit. Um, and so, you know, you, you get some of the kids to, you know, stick with you in future years and you keep adding on these recruiting classes, which are looking pretty good, you know, from everything I've, I've read for, from our recruiting guys, like Arkansas is possibly in line to have their, you know, their best recruiting class um, or recruit one of their top recruiting classes in the recruiting service era. That's, you know, that's, that's pretty solid. And, you know, he's leading the charge there. You're not going to coach on Sam Pittman staff. If you can't recruit, that is a non-negotiable. So um, I think it, it's interesting. I, I didn't expect, you know, maybe a $7 million a year type deal, 
Um, but I think if, if Arkansas, you know, wants to let people know that it's, it's serious about winning and competing in this league, um, and being, trying to get back to being one of the top dogs, you know, I think that's one of the ways that, that you make that statement. Just a few more thoughts on it. Number one, there's about to be more revenue that are coming into the SEC programs. They've got the new ESPN contract that comes up uh, beginning with the 2024 season. Uh, that's something to consider. I think that's going, that's, that's in the uh, decision making process for uh, the agents, the coaches, the ADs as they're, uh, you know, renegotiating or coming to new agreements uh, with new hires. Number two, remember Arkansas gave Eric Musselman a $4 million contract earlier this year. It is very rare to see an SEC program, especially, give its uh, football coach less money than its basketball coach. And so I think that plays a factor in this, in addition to the new hires in the SEC. And then it reminds me of the pro athlete, you know, who kind of has that one time to really hit it big. Uh, or, or most athletes really have that one paycheck. They talk about, you know, that one paycheck three, four years into their career, maybe five years into their career. And I think this is, you know, the time for, for Sam Pittman to potentially hit it big. You've got to strike while the iron's hot. It's obviously hot given where Arkansas was. Now they're eight and four. And, you know, not to mention his age. He's six, just turned 60 years old. You know, this is probably the last big contract that he'll negotiate uh, before he's uh, at a, a retirement age. And so I think all of those things go into that. And uh, it'll be certainly interesting to see what happens. But I don't think you can try to find a value in the SEC. You just can't. If you want to compete with the other teams, you're going to have to spend like the other teams for head coaches, for assistant coaches, for facilities, for recruiting. That's how you're going to compete with the best teams. And if you try to skimp in those levels, then it's probably not going to turn out real well for you. And so uh, it'll certainly be interesting to see what Arkansas and Sam Pittman uh, come up with in the, the, the upcoming months. As I mentioned, we will be back with another Whole Hog Football podcast next week. Dudley Dawson will join me to talk about the Razorbacks 2022 signing class. Also, be sure to catch our latest basketball podcast of Mid-America with me, Scotty, and Bob Holt. For Clay Henry and Scotty Bordelon, I'm Matt Jones. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time. The proceeding has been a production of WholeHogSports.com. Look for our latest podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.